title of this presentation is Purposeful, Purposeful Processes of Resilience. Um, so what this is, is a study I conducted this summer. Um, it's called an ethnography, so it's a study of my own experiences. So first, um, I want to just let you know how it'll go. So it's going to be about a 15 to 20 minute presentation, and then there'll be time for questions afterwards. And the reason why I have it set up that way is because I'm actually presenting this at a conference this summer, and that's usually how conference uh, presentations are structured. So I am, I really hope you do have questions. It's fine if you don't. But if something comes up, a question that you want to ask while I'm speaking, just write it down and then you can ask it when we get to the question period. Um, so first I'll tell you what the study is about is about my experiences with resilience. I've been studying resilience for a while now. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about resilience. I'll give you the context of my experiences. I'll tell you about the research design and how I implemented it, the data analysis and the results, and then what I want to do with it next. Um, so... Resilience. So like I said, I've been studying this since late 2016. I stumbled across resilience theory just looking for resources for a different paper. Um, and so what resilience is, it's defined as the ability to bounce back or reintegrate after difficult life experiences. Now up there, you will see that difficult has been italicized and it has been underlined. And there's a very specific reason for that, but I'll get to that here in a little bit. All right. So again, resilience is this ability to bounce back or reintegrate after difficult life experiences or adversity. Either of those terms works. Um, but there's two um, perspectives in which resilience is studied. So it's looked at from a process perspective, so how it's developed, but it's also studied from an outcome perspective. So the outcome of resilience, how to define it, measure it. This study looks at the process of it. And so looking at the process of resilience, uh, research shows that it's a discursive and dynamic process. And what I mean by discursive is that it happens through discourse. It happens through communication, through conversation, and through interactions. Um, dynamic means it's kind of flowing. It's not, it's not a rigid formula. It just kind of happens, and it does develop over time. So looking further into that, there's specific communication processes that are used to develop resilience. And so these are the processes here. I'll go over them real briefly and then we'll get more into them. So the first one is crafting normalcy. So it's a process in which you talk about the adversity or the difficult life, is, life experience in a way that makes it seem normal, all right? The next one is affirming identity anchors. So identity anchors are clusters of personality traits that you feel anchor yourself. They're basically your characteristics that are the most you. All right, so the process is you start talking about those very specific parts of yourself that you feel will give you some strength or some resilience. The next communication process of resilience is maintaining communication networks. So when we go through things, we talk to specific people about them because our specific networks provide us with different resources to deal with problems and adversity. The next one is putting alternative logics to work. So to develop resilience during a difficult life situation, you kind of have to do things differently. Life has changed, and so you have to alter the way you do things. And the way in which we facilitate that is through communication. So that's that idea of putting alternative logics to work. And then the last one is reframing. And so this one is the action of, or the act of legitimately acknowledging your right to feel bad about the situation, but then choosing productive action. So the best way to summarize it is with six words. This sucks, but I got this. All right, so that's the concept of reframing. So again, resilience is the ability to bounce back after difficult life experiences. So now I'll tell you about my difficult life experience. So in 2012, I started to get a little bit healthier and I wanted to lose some weight, but I got hella carried away with it and ended up developing anorexia. Uh, a couple of months after that, the body dysmorphia started kicking in and I kind of, I didn't kind of, I really struggled with it for about a year and a half. And at the peak of it, I was, my goal was to restrict my calories to a point where it would be negative daily. So I would only allow myself to eat enough food to where I'd take in about 400 calories, but then I'd make sure I worked out enough to where I'd burn 500. So that was kind of my diet and exercise routine for about a year and a half. And then out of nowhere, it just stopped. I just stopped doing that, but I reverted back to my old eating habits, which was only eating twice a day, a huge meal for breakfast and a huge meal for dinner. I would eat as much as I possibly could and it was all fast food, just the absolute worst stuff. And so after doing that for about six months, I realized I gained a bunch of weight back, freaked out, and then went right back to the anorexia. So then for the next few years, 
It was just this six month up and down ebb and flow of eating really bad, eating way too much, and then starving myself. Just, and with body dysmorphia kind of wrapping it all up into one terrible package with a ton of self-bullying. It was really, really bad. And on May 2nd, 2017, today, one year ago, is kind of the breaking point where I ended up having this really horrendous mental breakdown, threw myself into a panic attack that lasted about 10 hours. It was genuinely the most terrifying 10 hours of my entire life because I felt like I had truly lost control of my mind and I truly lost control of my emotions. After this 10 hour panic attack and I never, didn't even leave my apartment, I finally bring myself back together and I audibly say the words, damn, this is difficult. And the second I say difficult, it all hits me. All of the things that I've read about resilience come flashing right back into that definition, the ability to bounce back after a difficult life experience. And I look to the corner of my apartment and I see my stack of folders that has all my resilience research on it. That's it. That's exactly what I need. I need resilience because if I don't develop some resilience to this, I'm not going to make it another year. So it's a pretty dire situation. And now I have something I can work with, though, this idea of resilience. So I asked myself, can I develop my own resilience? Well, I have to. So what I decide to do is I'm going to purposefully enact these processes of resilience every single day. So I pull out my folder, I find these five communication processes of resilience that I talk about, and I say, I'm gonna do these every single day for three months, and we're gonna see what happens. So I spend a week thinking about myself, thinking about the situation, and trying to figure out how am I going to enact these processes. So the first one, crafting normalcy, well, I really don't know what the hell has happened. I don't understand how I'm thinking in my own diet. So the way I craft a normalcy is I'm just gonna journal it. I'm gonna journal every single second that I can think of. So I'm journaling my own thoughts, I'm journaling my conversations, I'm recording my diet, I'm recording my behaviors, all of it. So that's how I'm crafting normalcy. I'm just trying to understand what the situation is. The next one is affirming identity anchors. So I ask myself, what kind of identity anchors do I have in which I've displayed resilience? My first reaction is student. Because when I was an undergrad, I found myself with a 1.8 GPA, this close to being kicked out of the university on <laughs> academic probation. Three years later, I'm accepted into grad school, my tuition is paid for, and I'm getting paid every single month to study. If that's not resilience, I don't know what the hell is. So my idea is perfect. Student, I've got my identity anchor. The next one is communication network. How can I enact this? Well, I realize I've literally never told a single person about this. Nobody knows that I'm dealing with this. So, okay, I figure out the five people that I'm closest to, and I'm going to tell them. Now, I don't tell them every single day, but I am thinking about it every day. How can I tell them? I have a specific strategy on how to do it because each relationship is different, so I'm trying to tailor it to that. The next one is alternative logic. So what am I going to do differently? So I spent about a week journaling before I had this one figured out. Going back, looking at my journal, I've realized that every single time that I see my own reflection, whether it's in a mirror or whether it's in a shop window, I call myself a fat piece of shit, which I know is very harsh, but it's just the truth. And so I'm like, okay, I need to talk to myself better. This is my alternative logic. Instead of just stopping it, I'm just going to tone it down a little bit and I'm going to Notice when I say it, and I'm going to change it to FPOS, literally just the initials of it. And that's my idea on how to, take, how, how to tone it back. And then the next one is reframing, right? So now I'm like, okay, how can I reframe this? What is this similar to? So I'm thinking about my time as a basketball player. I have torn my meniscus, I've broken my leg, broken my ribs, I've dislocated every single finger, and I've also torn a ligament in my ankle, yet I kept hooping. I kept hooping, kept hooping, kept hooping. And at one point, I found myself invited to play with a pro team. So I'm like, damn. I know how to do stuff even though I'm injured. So I start viewing my anorexia as just a temporary injury instead of this permanent aspect of hopelessness. I reframe it as a brain sprain. So that's how I purposefully enacted those processes. And I did that every single day for three months. After three months, I sat down and I asked myself, did this work? And the answer is fucking A, it worked. It absolutely worked. Not only do I, have I stopped bullying myself, I have a healthy diet, I have... Act, I'm active. I do yoga every single day. And uh, I've just changed everything that I've done. The biggest thing that I noticed is I love food. I went from hating food to loving food for the first time in my life. So I see, all right, cool. This absolutely worked. This is worth continuing to study. So the next, sem uh, next semester, which was last semester, um, I'm in class, which is qualitative research too. And my uh, one of my assignments is to take a data set, analyze it, write a paper about it. 
So I'm like, I have this giant set of data in the form of my journal recordings because I journaled every single day. It's a huge stack. It's like 200 pages worth of stuff. So I'm like, that's what I'll do. I'll analyze it and see what we get. So there's these purposeful processes that I picked out that I knew I was going to enact daily. But going back and looking at the data, I see that there were emergent processes that I had no idea were going to happen, that just happened on their own. And so these are what they are, all right? So the first one is crafting normalcy. So I've always, I haven't always been an artist. I've been an artist for about three or four years. It's been a slow process. And I didn't expect that to be a source of my resilience. But it became one because I ended up drawing a lot of my feelings and a lot of the situations. So that was how I crafted normalcy about the situation is I started drawing it. And then that actually became an identity anchor for me as well. And the same thing, I didn't expect basketball to be an identity anchor because I've kind of stepped away from that since I've came back to UNM. But it just kind of came back full force unexpectedly. So it was this emerging identity anchor that allowed me to move forward with my plan of resilience. The next one was my communication network. Uh, this is a problem I've been dealing with since, uh, since 2012, and I've been aware that it's somewhat of a problem, and I thought several times I should probably see somebody, but I never had the strength to actually do so. Well, considering it from an aspect of communication network, it was a lot easier. So I finally saw a therapist, and it made a huge difference. That was Ray, and it was huge. It was absolutely monumental for my path forward. But I also started talking to just a lot more people. I started uh, talking to a nutritionist to kind of help me with my diet and give me some better ideas on what I'm doing and what I shouldn't be doing. But also I just started talking to my friends more. I started spending a lot more time with my friends and that made a huge difference too. And then the next one was my alternative logic. So I, uh, I really love fruit and so I decided to keep fruit with me every single day. So I literally don't leave my house without a piece of fruit. I start my day by eating a piece of fruit. I eat some sort of fruit within 10 minutes of waking up and then whenever I leave the house, I always have something with me, always. And then re uh, reframing, um, it's kind of like that same aspect of the brain sprain. This is temporary, but this is one of my favorite ones that emerged. And it's this idea of a Higgs rig, because that's my nickname, Higgs, because my last name is Higgins. All right, and so where that comes from is my dad. My dad is a mechanic, and he's a terrible mechanic. <laughs> everything, everything he fixes breaks in some sort of other way. And that's how we learned to fix things. Me and my brother were taught by him how to fix things. So we call it a rig because it doesn't actually fix. You fix one problem, but something else breaks. A couple of weeks later, that breaks and you have to fix that. And it's this continual process of fixing that, but this breaks until it just stops functioning altogether and you have to see a professional. Well, in reality, that's what I did with my diet. That's what I did with my body image, how I viewed myself. I rigged it. I changed it half-assed and didn't actually fix it. And then it just kept, ha kept having new problems, new problems, new problems. So I had to go back and see a professional and it worked, all right? So these are the, some of the emerging processes. These are just a few because there's so much. And that was one of the hardest things about putting this presentation together was narrowing it down to 20 minutes. But aside from that, I also noticed how the process of resilience is dynamic. Because remember in that initial definition, it's the ability to bounce back from difficult life experiences. It's discursive, so it happens through talking, conversations and interactions, but it's dynamic. So what does that mean? Well, it means that it's not hierarchical and it's not sequential. So no process is more important than the other, and it doesn't happen in a specific order. It just kind of flows and it happens. So a good example of this is how my identity anchor turned into an alternative logic, which led to a communication network, which actually came back to another alternative logic, which is a new identity anchor. So I'll explain that. One thing about me is I absolutely love language diction, and vocabulary. I just love it. I'm obsessed with words, especially words that rhyme, and especially alliteration, when you've got that same sound starting with words. So thinking about that from my ID anchor, I did a new alternative logic to build my diet, which was prioritize protein, grub greens, and fresh fruit. So that alliteration right there, just that came from my identity anchor, helped me develop my alternative logic, all right? So then a couple of days after I do that, I'm hanging out with my two best friends, they watched the documentary separately. They didn't watch it together, and it's called uh, What the Health. And after watching that, they decide they're going to be vegetarians. They run this idea by me. I'm down. I'm super down. Let's do this. So all three of us, we decide to go into this new alternative logic about our diets with vegetarian. They've stopped. I didn't. I've been a vegetarian for nine months now, so essentially I'm a newborn vegetarian baby. And that's my new identity anchor. And it has a lot to do with everything I do now. That's part of the reason why I keep fruit with me because it plays into my identity anchor as a vegetarian. So looking at this post-completion uh, analysis, looking at how things have changed is seeing the dynamism of the processes of resilience. 
So what that all means, what I really found is that, because the initial question was, can I develop resilience? And what I studied before this was leadership and leadership strategies. And the, the bigger question is, can resilience be a strategy? And what I found is the answer is yes, because I made it a strategy for myself. But it's important to note that resilience is cultural and it's contextual. So what I mean by that is every person's path to resilience is based on two things. It's based on the culture in which they identify with, and it's based on the context of the adversity that they're experiencing. So for me personally, I banked on my identity, the culture of academia, the culture of basketball, and the culture of my family, just being a Higgins. Those things were very crucial for my path to resilience. But then there's also the context of it. So looking at other studies of resilience, uh, the main um, scholar that has studied, her name's Patrice Buzanon, the way she studied it was in communities that have gone through economic hardship and communities that were dealing with uh, Hurricane Katrina. And what she found for those communities was the most important process for them was the communication network because they were experiencing adversity that was communal. It affected the entire group. So the process to resilience also had to include the entire group. But my adversity was mine. It is all in here. And so my process forward was also all in here. And so that's why I say that resilience is cultural and it's contextual. And you have to keep those in mind if you want to strategize it, which is what I want to do. So that's what's kind of next for me right now. For my master's degree, I'm studying resilience as an element of basketball culture because that's one thing that I've learned from athletics is that it really helps you get through tough times. Every single athlete that I've ever known that has played at an elite level, even at the lower levels, they'll tell you that their sport helped them get through something, and I want to know about that. So that's what I study because at the doctorate level, my PhD, I want to continue to study that same thing. And for a life perspective, I'd like to develop my own degree program that's called positive leadership that's based on resilience, positive psych, and positive communication. Because I want to be a resource for organizations, teams, and communities when they're going through tough times, just from studying all of this stuff. So that's my research. That's what I found. That's what I've learned. And that's what I've written about. Um, I'm actually presenting this at the ninth European Conference on Positive Psychology in Hungary this summer. Um, so that's why I wanted to practice this today. So with that being said, I truly, sincerely appreciate your time and your presence and your attention. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. If you don't, don't feel bad. I know that's a lot. I won't be offended if you don't have any questions. Have you ever um, like relapsed to your own behavior? Have you ever been like yeah, so um, July 3rd was a particularly difficult day for me. Uh, last year, my friends were having a July 4th party, and I had been feeling a lot better because I'd been doing this stuff for about six weeks, and I'd made really great progress. Uh, but then I just relapsed. I was getting dressed, getting ready to go, and I was looking at myself in the mirror and just started berating myself and ended up not going and just sat down and just didn't go. And so that moment was a true relapse. And But that kind of mental breakdown, I realized, wasn't nearly as bad as the first one. So I'm like, oh, okay, like it's not as bad. So this actually is working. So that really helped me. Um, but I do still have some of those same thought processes. So when I was anorexic, one of the things that I loved the most is when I would have like, I'd eat lunch and then I'd have a really busy day and I wouldn't eat for about eight or nine, 10 hours. I'd get home at like midnight and I'd be like, cool, I'm so tired. I can just go to bed without eating anything. I'm going to lose weight doing that. Occasionally I'll still have those thoughts. I'll get home after I had one like two weeks ago. I got home and I was like, damn, I've been eating like 10 hours. I can just go to bed. Like, no, nah, no, nah, that's not healthy. And then I ate some food and I felt a lot better. So it's not like I feel like I'm totally cured. It's that I feel like if this problem arises, I have the skills necessary to deal with it in a positive manner. Um, did you have any like communication networks or relationships like when you told them about this problem that they didn't react in a way that was helpful to you? Was that harder on you or did you not have that experience? Uh, I didn't have that experience. Um, there was a couple of, there was one that was frustrating when I told a particular person because their first response was, why didn't you tell me sooner? Which is like, because it's just hard. Like, what do you mean? Like, how, people don't. But other than that, everybody was very supportive and, and very helpful and understanding and just kind of listened. And, and yeah. One thing that's kind of hard is, is, uh, is I know that if, like my parents worry a little bit. Because right now, I'm actually probably the slimmest I've been. Um, but I also eat more than I have. Like I eat all day, every day. I eat four meals a day with snacks in between. So I know my mom seeing me thin and then telling her, Hey, I actually used to struggle with starving myself. I know she worries with that, but it's a process. Um, so yeah.
Okay. So you were my teacher last year, you were my public speaking teacher that last semester when I guess all of this was happening. Yep. So my question just was, um, do you think that having like your career, like you're my teacher, all these other roles, do you think that that deteared from your healing process or? So I looked at it as I can't like, I love teaching. I'm very driven to be a great teacher. And I, my whole thing was, I can't let this affect my teaching. So it was, well, how can this help my teaching? Well, I'm a, I'm a student right now and I need to learn about myself. I need to learn about my habits and I need to learn how to be healthy. And so putting myself back in the perspective of learning actually really helped me relate to my students of their learning too. Even if it's not something as heavy as this, it's this idea of we're all learning together. And I think that really helped me create a better classroom environment. So when you're going through your um, journey, um, did you have like a certain process that you followed, like a daily routine um, to get into like, your positive state of mind? Like did you do meditation and yoga? Stuff like that. Yeah, so at first, uh, the first about six weeks was just trying a lot of different things to find it. And now I do have it. And it's one, I within 10 minutes of waking up, I eat a piece of fruit. And 10 minutes after that, I do yoga. Um, and it's only, I, I do yoga every single day, but I haven't done yoga for more than 30 minutes. It's just a matter of doing just something that I just feel better about. Like I, I finish yoga and I'm like, oh, that was nice. And that helps me carry that throughout the whole day. Um, but also just the act of practicing gratitude. Uh, one thing that was really weird is one of the things I was always very self-conscious about was my legs because I was made fun of my legs when I was growing up. And so I was always really self-conscious about it. And one day I was taking a bath. This was like eight months ago or six months ago. I was taking a bath. I was looking at my legs I'm like, damn, I like my legs. <laughs> that was weird. That was a strange moment. But it was this idea of practicing gratitude because that came from me thinking about how many injuries I've had with my legs. A dislo I mean, a, a torn meniscus, I've hyperextended my knee, I've torn a ligament, I've broken my ankle, and I'm like, y'all still holding up tough, you're some beast of legs, like, good work. <laughs> so this idea of gratitude and being grateful for the small things is really what changed everything for me. While studying resiliency, did you want to choose sports at first, or did you think um, it, it, was, it started with sports. So I was writing a paper about leadership in, in sports because that's what I was originally going to do my master's on was just better forms of leadership because um, I found that too many coaches are bullies and there's a difference between being disciplined and strict and then bullying. And that's what I was kind of trying to change. So I was looking at that. And when I found resilience, I had gotten like really fired up about it. And then somebody else in my department they were doing a presentation at a sport communication conference and they're like, Hey, we know you like sports. Do you want to participate? Absolutely. I'm like, what about? And they're like, whatever you want. Like, oh shit. So I'm like, well, I like resilience right now. So I actually did a study of Brandon Marshall from the NFL because he was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. And he gave a press conference talking about it. And in that press conference, every single process of resilience is there. And so that's when I got this idea of like, hmm, sports really do help people get through shit. And so that's how it started with this idea of sports and then has just kind of evolved into what it is. Has becoming a vegetarian helped you through this process? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it just, uh, it just gave me some purpose with, with food because before it was always just like, ah, I got to eat and let's eat whatever is the most satisfying is how it was. And so it turned, it, it went from food being an act of, of satisfaction to an act of self-care. Um, because this idea of me being a student, it's like, all right, well, I'm smart. I know that I'm smart. Let's apply this to what I'm doing because how I was eating before was pretty stupid. So let's change this and be smart about it. And a vegetarian kind of helped me with that. And I'm not strictly vegetarian. If you put some pepperoni pizza in front of my face, I'm absolutely going to eat it. Um, but yeah, so it, that's kind of how, how that helped. Anything else? Yeah, Cam. Sorry, okay. One more. Sure, um, so I feel like, and I admire you so much for even talking about this, because I feel like when it comes to like males and body image, like a lot of people do struggle with that. I mean, I did, you know, way back in high school. But um, being that like with masculinity on the line and stuff, males don't usually talk about this or admit it to themselves. So what would you say to any males going through this, whether they're in athletics or otherwise, that don't want to put the label on it, that are uncomfortable with it and don't really want to like um, I mean, you can, you can move forward and develop healthier habits without outwardly admitting that you're struggling with an eating disorder, but it does help to just kind of, to kind of admit it. Um, that was one thing that I was looking at in my research is the, the rate of diagnosis in men. 
and only one out of 10 eating disorder diagnoses come from men. And it's a problem that affects anywhere between 20 to 40 million Americans per year. And that's just Americans per year. And only one out of 10 are men. And so some of the, some of the men that I have shared this with later that day wrote me like, thank you. I actually have struggled with it too. So I know that it's, there's a lot more people that do. And it's just kind of that aspect. I mean, it was tough when I told my best friend about it, it was very tough to tell him. And it was just like, you know what? Fuck it. Like this is where I'm at. And for me to run from where I'm at, that's not, that doesn't fit into masculinity. That's running from a problem. And that in itself is not masculine. So there's ways to kind of reframe it. And that's the idea of, of that communication process, the way you think about it and the way you talk about it. Um, has a lot to do with it. Anything else? No. Just real quick, I'm going to show you uh, the w one of the drawings that I did of how I depicted an eating disorder. Oh, snap. Oh. So I drew this on May 9th last year, um, and I was just trying to draw how I felt. And it felt like I, it's a little dark, but I felt like I was dying from the inside. That's why there's a black ball of doom just hanging out in my gut. And it was interesting because I didn't actually mean, like I wanted it to be coming out, but I didn't actually mean to have it piercing through my head like that. But that's actually really what was happening is this problem with eating surrounding food was dominating my mental space. Um, and then in the background, there's just this aspect of death, which is the skull um, kind of in between the lines. But over here in at that time, it was actually creeping into real life. So it was it was pretty drastic. So this is how. One of the ways in which I uh, crafted normalcy through my artistic endeavors. And the tunnel? Oh, yeah, that was just a tunnel, tunnel of doom. Like, I, I just felt like I stood no chance with that thing. Um, at the time, it was like, this is where I'm going. But now it's like, oh, no, I was going this way, away from the darkness, which is pretty cool. That's beautiful. Yeah. Any other questions? Cool. Well, I appreciate y'all listening, and I appreciate your feedback. <laughs> I'm very grateful for you. <laughs> Anybody can bring their GPA from 1.6 <laughs> and get into grad school. So actually, there was a lot of communication processes of resilience involved in that as well. Um,